Well, I'm, I'm very glad to be here at Villanova again. Villanova is getting really famous for being a leader in liberal education with all these centers and required courses and all that. So it's collapsing everywhere in America, liberal education, but it's actually surging at, at Villanova. Uh, and so the two things Villanova are, uh, seem to be most famous for today are the uh, resurgence of liberal education and the pump fake. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, the pump fake. Uh, but the pump fake can fail you, uh, as you know, if you don't uh, follow up by making the uh, subsequent shot. But I'm not, you know, I was uh, very sad to see Villanova lose because I think Villanova is literally the only team that could have beaten Kentucky. And Kentucky is, the, is known for this fact. None of its leading players have to even pretend they're college students because they're all gone after the first year. I'm, uh, I'm impressed, I think. Now it's, uh, now it's almost too much. But it's, you know, I'm a mumbler, so it's okay, it's good. So we're going to talk today about Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, the best book ever written on democracy, the best book ever written on America. And how can you tell that a book is good? It becomes truer and truer after it's written. So we're going to talk about individualism today. And all kinds of boring historians have written complaints about Tocqueville to this effect. America was not very individualistic in the 1830s. And you know, every one of those books is right. America has become more and more individualistic over time because Tocqueville says individualism is not so much an American quality but a democratic quality that will creep over time in any modern democracy. So the history of America is creeping and sometimes creepy individualism, but not always creepy. So part two, uh, volume two of Democracy in America. Forget about volume one, volume two of Democracy in America. The part about individualism is the second part which is about the democratic heart. Part one is about the democratic head, the democratic brain. And Tocqueville opens part one with a joke, which I guarantee you will not laugh at. The Americans are Cartesians who've never read a word of Descartes. All right, I was right. Uh, <laughs> It's a very nerdy joke and, in a way, a very French joke. Uh, all right, but why is that? Uh, Descartes was a philosopher, and if you wanted to reduce Descartes to one word, to kind of a bumper sticker, it would be doubt. Descartes is all about the doubt. Descartes was all about the doubt for philosophical reasons, which you'll be glad to know I'm not going to tell you about. Uh, but Americans are all about the doubt for political reasons. If I don't doubt you, you rule me. So to be a free person intellectually is to doubt personal authority, to doubt priests, doubt parents, doubt uh, politicians, philosophers, poets, all the way down the line. So we Democrats are all about the doubt because we like to think, I don't need you. I can think for myself. I'm not a free man or a free woman unless I can think for myself. So the Democratic uh, bumper sticker here is, which you've probably actually seen, question authority. I always write under that bumper sticker, why? <laughs> uh, but you try, but if, if you, take anyone's word intellectually, then you're being ruled by them. So how many of y'all have noticed when you trust your professors when it comes to the syllabi, you're letting them rule you? Wouldn't you rather have, if you go to a school of education, they actually talk like this as possible, a community of learners 
which on the first day of class, you all sit down and decide what to do. But even that wouldn't work for you if you're a radical Democrat because you would doubt the community that's made up of persons. So democracy is all about the doubt. Uh, and uh, it begins with an assertion. Nobody is better than me. Have you ever seen Taxi Driver? Nobody's better than me. And so I feel very proud. Nobody's better than me. Uh, so next time you're in class, raise your hand and say to the professor, you're not better than me. <laughs> All right. But, uh, and that's a proud assertion of intellectual equality, right? But with that proud assertion of intellectual equality, here's what will never happen. You will never read Descartes. It's what, what, how, it's the only way you'd ever come to read Descartes because you trusted someone's word that it's a good book. All right. So nobody's better than me. But then it sort of occurs to you, occurs to you almost right away, there's a downside of this. I'm no better than anyone else. So what right do I have to privilege my opinion over the sea of opinions that surround me? And the sea of opinions that surround you in a democracy can be reduced to one opinion in a way. Public opinion. Where does public opinion come from? Nobody knows. It's not really personal. And everyone obeys it. So if everyone obeys it, that's democratic. Because no one in particular is ruling. So in democracy, what really happens is personal authority is replaced by public opinion. You defer because you have no right not to defer. You think for yourself, but why? What do you have? What resources do you have that's superior to everyone else's thought? Not only that, if you try to think all by yourself, all that happens is your brain gets dizzy, disoriented, because even consciousness means, the word consciousness literally means thinking with others. So try to think all by yourself. You get disoriented, fearful. You get intellectually paralyzed. That's what else happens. You get practically paralyzed. And so democratic free thought ends up in a kind of thoughtless conformity. And it actually, in our democracy, is really true that the people who believe most fervently in personal authority are the countercultural people. Who's more countercultural than the Amish or the homeschooled or the traditional Catholics? Yada, yada, yada. They're the ones not, uh, not hanging out. Well, no one goes to the mall anymore. I've got nothing to replace the mall with right now. All right, so, so democratic intellectual freedom means thinking all by yourself, a kind of intellectual isolation. And so you go to volume two, and here's what Tocqueville says. Not only does the democratic mind turn inward, the democratic heart turns inward. There's a kind of emotional withdrawal or a kind of heart disease. That's kind of an analogy, heart disease. So, and then Tocqueville calls that emotional withdrawal individualism. Here's one thing he says. Individualism is not the same thing as selfishness because selfishness is an instinct. Everyone's selfish. Every animal is selfish, at least most of them. Every mammal is selfish, let's say. Selfishness is natural. It's an instinct. But individualism is a judgment, a judgment. And I'll tell you about that judgment in a moment. But individualism is not the rugged individualism of the lonely cowboy on the range. It's not the heroic architect of Ayn Rand. And individualism is not manliness, that kind of display of courage or generosity or magnanimity. So individualism is not what you see in John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or Atticus Finch or Matthew McConaughey a lot lately, or for that matter, or for that matter, uh, my favorite uh, 
magnanimous man of America this year, the American Sniper. We all seen the American Sniper. I'm, I'm going to use some of my precious time telling you about my experience seeing the American Sniper, because this is the opposite of Tocquevillian individualism. So I, I heard this was, you know, it's a Clint Eastwood movie, even though his recent movies before this had stunk. Like he managed to make the Jersey Boys boring. Uh, I thought you guys probably think all Greaser music is boring, but actually, uh, uh, okay. But the American Sniper was, uh, I heard it was good, so we go, and I go with my wife, and for the first time ever in my life, we were 20 minutes early. And every, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, every the, uh, seat in the theater is filled, except for one, and so, you know, I sit there, so my wife is out of luck, but this, uh, <laughs> Uh, but this gentleman gets up, because we are in the South now, and offers her the seat. Uh, let's not ex you know, exaggerate a little. So it really is a good movie. And so when it was over, I wanted to applaud. Because oh, usually, you know, when, uh, applause in a movie is reserved for really outstanding films, right? But I, I got like this and get stopped. And it was great that I stopped, because everyone else in the theater got up in respectful silence and walked out because they saw the best of the South, a certain kind of greatness. It was kind of the American Iliad. But that's not individualism, that's an individual. That's individuality. So individualism is kind of the opposite of the American sniper, the apathetic indifference to the fate of others. And it's based on, it's the head that messes up the thought, the heart. Individualism is based on the misguided judgment, Tocqueville says, a mistaking judgment, that the main effects of the social passions of love and hate are, are to produce injustice and cruelty. It's based upon the judgment that love makes us miserable. Love is more trouble than it's worth. Or to quote the uh, great Kelly Clarkson of a few years ago, love sucks. And why does love suck? It's for suckers. So uh, individualism is based upon the thought that, oh, that's too dangerous. I'd be better off without that relational baggage. So individualism comes from and contributes to the democratic destruction of the relational ties that connect citizens, family members, creatures, and members of a class. So if you want to review examples of the American heart disease of individualism. Here's something you can do. Watch Seinfeld. Seinfeld is nothing but a display. You all seen Seinfeld? There's no common culture anymore. <laughs> My students, only common culture is Seinfeld and To Kill a Mockingbird. But I already explained To Kill a Mockingbird's not individualism. So watch Seinfeld. If you haven't seen Seinfeld, you can watch Two and a Half Men when Charlie Sheen was still on, it got creepy after that. Uh, or to watch Friends, because what's the secret of understanding Friends? They had no friends. They were locked up in this little apartment uh, with each other. So uh, individualism means to be so emotionally impoverished that all you have is a narrow circle of friends uh, in the midst of a crowded and highly erotic, a highly passionate city. So, you know, there's a lot of Seinfeld you could talk about, but uh, Jerry had three friends, right? One day, he got a fourth friend. He, he met this guy at the health club. So they palled around for a couple days, and then one day, Jerry just walks away from him, abandons him in the subway. He says, I just can't handle it. Three friends is enough. That's all I'm hardwired for it can't take on a fourth. That's individualism. So we, uh, and I'm showing my age here by giving you this example. You can see individualism criticized in this bestseller of about uh, 27, 28 years ago called The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. That used to be read in college. I think not so much anymore. But the truth of the matter is all kinds of social critics plagiarize shamelessly from Alan Bloom. The most, probably the most famous one is uh, the New York Times uh, columnist David Brooks. All David Brooks is is Alan Bloom light. 
So according to Alan Bloom, sophisticated American students these days, uh, he meant more of the University of Chicago than Villanova where we still have religion and, and stuff, uh, sophisticated American students have flat souls. They're incapable of being moved by love or death. They're emotional solitaries and they're all about being nice. And their music is all about reducing human eros to the rhythm of the mechanical running of animals. That's an exaggeration, don't be too offended. But admit it's a little bit true. How much of popular music today is pretty much the rhythm of the mechanical running of animals? Okay, I'm not gonna dwell on that because I don't want you to hate me. Uh, but uh, there's this uh, uh, French critic that, that was mentioned in the introduction, Pierre Menat, and here's what he says individualism is. Not to know the meaning of relational verbs, like to love, to create, to long for. Not to know the meaning of verbs that express the transcendence of yourself. So again, this would be on Seinfeld, George Costanza, the, he wants to, was the, uh, kind of the caregiver of a very feisty and relational old man. And finally, the old man uh, looks at him and says, don't you have any yearnings? And he says, uh, no yearnings, maybe a few cravings. All right, so aristocracies were better than democracy when it comes to love. Why is that? Members of classes and extended families were connected in many, many ways. So I could tell you all about aristocracies, I guess, but let me just give you the footnote, Downton Abbey. Not much of an aristocracy, but good enough. But aristocracies were worse when it comes to justice. And aristocracies were worse when it comes to cruelty because aristocrats intensely loved and hated a very small number of people and kind of cruelly ignored everywhere else. So what's the most unrealistic thing on Delton Abbey? Is the people upstairs know anything about the people downstairs? They've kind of humanized aristocracy a lot on, on Delton Abbey. How many of y'all seen Delton Abbey? All right, good, thank you. All right, my advice to every one of you is to watch more TV. <laughs> <laughs> so as democracy emerges, love retreats, but compassion emerges. People become less loving than sensitive. So erotic, dangerous liaison guy becomes sensitive guy. Uh, and, and why is it easy to be sensitive? Because people become more and more alike. So people tend to bring everyone into their circle of concern. Now compassion is weaker than love because it doesn't really inspire you to virtue. But compassion allows you to be okay with government programs that benefit everyone. So during the period of democratic compassion, we have big government that redistributes resources. So you guys don't actually want to hang out with poor people yourselves, but you're sensitive enough to be taxed for that. Government can help them out. Maybe the church can help them out. So you have this general sensitivity that replaces intense love. And compassion is very just in a way because it's extended to everyone. But Compassion is, all things considered, weaker than love. When it dominates, there really is heart disease. People are less erotic. And then what happens after compassion? It's replaced by indifference. So if you think about it, and this might scare you, but I think it's actually true, the era of big government is over because Americans are no longer very compassionate and their compassion has been replaced by a certain generalized indifference. 
And so how many are would admit that uh, uh, liberal Democrats are being replaced by libertarians? And what's the characteristic of a libertarian? To lack compassion. Libertarians call the Democrats the pity party. They lack sense of no offense, but they lack sensitivity. And so how many would admit that what we see going on in America now is a general replacement of compassion which I'm not altogether for, with indifference. So, here's what, in, here's what uh, individualism requires of you. It doesn't require you to love or pity. It only requires that you not hate. So a good individualist finds no trouble avoiding hate crimes, because hate crimes would, would require actually hating and hate and love are usually connected in some weird way. So here's, what, here's the slogan of the individualist, which I also stole from Seinfeld. Not that there's anything wrong with that. So whatever other people are doing, you yawn. And not about the obvious thing Seinfeld was referring to there, but pretty much about everything. Like, uh, and so another uh, libertarian virtue is, or um, strike that, brought that up. Another individualist virtue is being non-judgmental. And there are some things you shouldn't be judgmental about, but an individualist is pretty much non-judgmental about anything. Your friends, neighbors, family members, fellow citizens and fellow creatures do. And in order to be a genuine individualist, not only do you have to say, not that there's anything wrong with that. You have to really, really mean it. So you can't do it with an age. You have to do it from the depth of your heart that ain't much of a heart. And uh, so individualism means priding yourself in a way in avoiding all the inegalitarian justice that accompanies love. It goes without saying you can't love everyone. And your intense love is only given to a privileged few. So the way to perfect equality is to progressively diminish the power of love. So family ties, citizenship, friendship, and so forth. So what's the problem with this? Here's what Tocqueville says. Individualism, by emotionally isolating us from one another, make us all easy prey for despots. It's a characteristic of a despot, the characteristic of a tyrant, to call people who keep to themselves good citizens. So when a secret police comes to drag you off, I yawn, and I'm a good citizen. So, and looking at Tocqueville as a whole, there's kind of a movement from volume one to volume two. Volume one is all about tyranny of the majority. Tocqueville, like our founders, were primarily interested in protecting minority rights from an aroused majority. An aroused majority of particular people with names. And so, our founders and Tocqueville regarded the strong institutions of government as the equivalent of political Prozac. Democracy won't be compatible with liberty unless we can calm people down and make them less moody. So what's the point of representative government? To calm you down, to get the lawmaking away from you a little bit. So volume one is about the various forms of American political Prozac that chills you out, like juries, administrative decentralization, and all that. Some people still today think that the main threat to liberty in America is an aroused majority, like the card-carrying members of the ACLU. But most people think those critics worry too much. So isn't it true, when you think about it, that the dominant concern in America today is about political apathy and degrading dependence 
the great independence of people of forces they can't even control. So I already talked about the stupefying effects of public opinion. And if I have a lot of time, I talk about high technology. So what is the main fueling force of individualism in America today, not predicted by Tocqueville? And the answer would be the screen. The replacement of virtual, real reality with other human beings with the virtual reality of the screen. So the great philosopher, comedian, Louis C.K., won't let his daughters have smart devices like iPhones, iPods, and, and not, they could probably have iPods, iPads and so forth, because the result is no empathy. They don't have that animal feeling, that instinctual connection with other people. And so on mine, it's just too easy to criticize people, too easy to be mean, right? So have you all seen the movie, I'm gonna try one more time. Have you all seen the movie Her? Anyone seen Her? It's about the guy who falls in love with the operating <coughs> system. It's one bleeping great movie. And, and the great thing about, uh, according to studies, who is the most beautiful woman in the world? There are actually people who measure this. And the answer is Scarlett Johansson. So that's going to be on, on, on the final. Uh, 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 yeah. But this movie, uh, this guy falls in love with the voice of Scarlett Johansson. You never actually see her. And he's just a nice guy. He's not bad or good. And so he finds out he prefers an operating system to a real woman. What's wrong with a real woman? Too much emotional baggage. Too much, too much intensity. Uh, too much conflict. So how many of you guys, and you women too, because uh, it, on a movie women fall in love with operating systems too, wouldn't you prefer someone attuned to your personal needs? Someone absolutely compliant someone who understands you perfectly because they are perfectly unjudgmental. Whatever you want to do, it's okay. And uh, whatever you want to do is reinforced by your operating system. What's the downside of this? So the reason the movie is good is it intensifies things we already see with online gaming and the addiction of online porn. I mean, what's more individualistic than online porn? You can have uh, the mechanical gratification with no relational baggage. So I could do a creepy thing. How many of you guys prefer online porn to real girlfriends? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I think what you, what you said was, yeah, sure, what's your question? No, no. Uh, <laughs> Which was the problem here? But, but so do you see the, the, the high technology intensifies these individualistic tendencies that, that are already there? And I could also, if I wanted to, talk about the strange thing that's going on when all of life is being turned over to the economic language of contract and consent. So how many, uh, how many even, probably not here at Villanova because uh, you try to be Catholic, but at most, at most colleges, they, they, they actually have a sexual ethic, which is you can do anything you want as long as it's safe and consensual. So do you understand there's no relational baggage there, right? So, so, it's, it's, it's only, it's, so contract and consent. No means no, that's a contract. Uh, the other part of the contract is yes means yes. And that's all there is. And so today when people look at American politics, American culture and all this, they see the Americans don't need Prozac. Uh, their whole environment is uh, chilling them out way too much. And so the people who really think about this is, uh, you know what Americans really need today is some kind of political Viagra. They need to be aroused. So the problem is they're not erotic enough. So that's not true, uh, but it is true. I'll give you 86 examples of this. Keep in mind that all these tendencies are exaggerations which are becoming more true. So who is more erotic? To use Tocqueville's two examples. 
us or the pilgrims, because the individual, uh, us or the Puritans, because the individualist is like the opposite of the Puritan. So on the PowerPoint back here, you have the Puritan, all these stages, uh, the individualist. Who is more erotic? And the answer is, uh, will come to you if you think about this. You showed a Puritan man an ankle, and he was aroused. You guys see uh, perfectly sculpted, almost uh, uh, naked women all over TV, and what do you do? Yawn. So who's more erotic, the Puritan or you? It's no accident that Viagra had to be invented these days. No, just like that. All right. Uh, so Pete, so don't, doesn't everyone complain? Citizens no longer take uh, responsibility for each other. That's a Democratic complaint. The Republican complaint is people no longer take responsibility for themselves. So uh, here's one example of how bad our heart disease has become. There is a crippling birth dearth. We're not having enough kids. This is something Tocqueville did not predict. He thought individualism would kind of stop at the door of the nuclear family and people would still uh, be loosen up enough to have unprotected sex and have a bunch of kids. Uh, but it turns out not to be true. So the, the two great social trends of our time are one is this. We're no longer puritanical when it comes to the soul. We're no longer intrusive when it comes to the soul. We think the Puritans were nuts when they tried to criminalize every sin. Although they did that quite democratically. They, they were bizarre, why would they do that? Today, what are we puritanical about? And the answer is, I think, health and safety, where we're having more and more laws. When I was growing up, and this is gonna amaze you, you could ride a motorcycle without a helmet. You could drive a car without a seatbelt. And I could give you 50 examples along those lines. Not only that, you could smoke indoors. And other people weren't scared to death of, of that. And, and, and so forth and so on. You've seen the show Mad Men? Did that hit a nerve? All those things, those dangerous things they did on Mad Men. Like, you know, smoke, drink, not exercise, multiple martinis at a lunch, uh, unprotected sex with women you don't know, all those dangerous things they did on Mad Men, we now think are crazy. We're very judgmental when it comes to health and safety. Admit we are. So we used to say this, only the good die young. Now what do we say? Only the stupid and self-indulgent die young. And this is in many respects good. The, more, uh, the older I get, the more that I see the advantages of living a very long time. Uh, but, <laughs> but having said that, it is kind of, a, kind of a, 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 an intense focus on oneself at the expense of others. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm staying around forever. I'm not going to be replaced. And how many have noticed that we are really paranoid these days about extinction? You've seen interstellar, is that going to work? You know, it's supposed to make you really paranoid about species extinction. How many of y'all have heard about the singularity and simply overcoming death? And there's actually fools in Silicon Valley who actually believe that could happen and all that. So we're really paranoid about, about extinction, right? And it's good, I mean, it's good to live a long time. But we have these two trends. Both people are living much longer than ever because they're tending to themselves a lot more and they're having fewer and fewer kids. And that fuels the progress of individualism at the political level because our entitlements have no future. If these two trends continue, which they will, we won't have enough young people to fund the entitlements for the old people. Actually, we don't, everyone already knows this. Medicare and Social Security are toast. Uh, they're toast because of the demographic issue that no one knows how to address. So it's not because the Democrats are evil or anything like that, although they may be, but it has something to do with this. It's just the Social Security and Medicare would have lasted forever if we continued to have demographics in the early 1960s, but they're toast. So you understand that the individualistic personal behavior is actually destroying the government. I'll, I'll give you a way of remembering this. Uh, if, if you want to save Social Security and Medicare for 
yourselves and your posterity. I have a two-point program. And if everyone here in America, if I could only be evangelical and go to every college in America and, and give this advice, maybe we could save these social programs. I mean, Obama, you know, all, all, what he really says is, I'm delaying their death. I have your back for now, but I have no long-term plan. And everyone knows Obamacare is not sustainable. Although I don't think it's simply evil either, but it's not sustainable. All right, here's a two-point program. You ready? First one is important. Start smoking and really stay with it because otherwise you'll live too long. So not that long ago you had very patriotic men who smoked and drank and had pot bellies and dropped dead in their 50s. And not only that, they had three or more kids and didn't get a dime with Social Security or Medicare. Those were patriots. Try to, try to, uh -huh. <laughs> try to, try to emulate their behavior in your lives. Don't try to stay around too long. And I think the easiest way to accomplish this goal is to start smoking. And you young women especially, don't get smoked for a few years and quit because you're 40 or 30, because that probably won't hurt you. Really stay with it your whole life until the abrupt end. Uh, and then the second one, which is just as important, is start having babies. Live like a Mormon. Start having babies right now and really stay with that as well. Right now, but you know, after the lecture. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> And how many, how many think Americans today are going to follow uh, this two-point program? Very few, very few. And uh, so here's the good news. The road to serfdom never gets to serfdom because of the demographic time bomb. So the individualism of Americans, which might be understood to fuel big government because of dependency, actually ends up destroying big government. And so the libertarians win, not because they're right, but because of the, and they might be right, I'm not taking a stand on that, but actually we have no idea how we're gonna pay for this stuff in the future. So you really can't be a progressive anymore in the sense of being for bigger and better government. And if you really think about it, that's why the Democrats are completely focusing on the social issue. While the social issues, now, while the Democrats are all about same-sex marriage and all that. But I'll put, I'm not taking a stand on same-sex marriage, except that's a consequence of individualism, too, where marriage has morphed into a situation where it's all rights and no duties. So I ask you today, what's one duty you have assumed under the law when you get married? You cannot name one, can you? So no, you know, chastity, you can have, you know, Chastity is no longer virtue, anyone cares, but everyone has sex before marriage. Uh, marital fidelity is kind of a lifestyle option. You don't have to have kids when you get married. Not only that, uh, we have hordes of people who are married without kids, and we have hordes of people who are unmarried with kids. So what's the responsibility connected with uh, the government uh, uh, marriage license, or what Justice Kennedy calls the government affirmation of your relational dignity or something like that? Well, there's no responsibility. Therefore, gay Americans say, why can't we be included? And I tell you the truth, it's not so clear what the answer would be in a highly individualistic time. You got that? If there, were, if there are particular responsibilities connected with marriage, you could say, well, no, the responsibilities. What in fact are the responsibilities connected with marriage now? So, so we don't, no one stigmatizes single moms anymore, and that's good, right? I could talk about this forever, but uh, instead of talking about Tocqueville, about what the heck. All right, so you would think this is good for men because uh, which gender slack sex, uh, which, who walks around all proud that I want to divorce sex from relational responsibilities? This seems to be good for men, right? Because when women uh, uh, are, are more okay about hooking up than they used to be, yeah, well, that's good. But there, there are problems, that is. Uh, in, in a country full of single moms and very few single dads, what question comes to mind? Well, what are men for? What are men for now? And so, aren't, aren't, you know, with, without the, the civilizing relational institutions, right? That, uh, that exactly, what, what are men for? 
And so you see this kind of despondency among men now. Uh, what's, is, is, what's, what's the uh, gender ratio at Villanova? 52-48. Well, the Europe, Europe, yeah, so the Catholic men are, remain more manly, I guess. In your typical liberal arts college is 60-40. In my school, it's 63, which is a good school, believe it or not, it's 63-37. So you know what we did in desperation? Started D3 football, which is ridiculous. It's like over a million dollars a year to see a team worse than your high school team. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can't give them scholarships. So you, you, can come, you can come play in a bad football team at our college for free. Uh, we're not going to pay you a dime for that. And you can get beat up every weekend and get, probably get a concussions and shorten your lifespan. Now, if you're in the SEC, that makes sense because you might become a millionaire. In fact, it's very likely to become a millionaire at the SEC. But D3 football is utterly ridiculous. Uh, okay, but we did it in desperation. And for one year, the first year, the coach had to recruit 108 guys. I don't know where we hit 50-50. We're back to 63-37. All right. So in an individualistic country, in a certain way, men become superfluous because their connection with kids is less immediate, you know, less biological. For example, when a couple says, we're pregnant, this is biologically untrue, unless there's some biotechnological development I don't know about. Because who, I mean, uh, studies show, and I've read many of these studies, that only women get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, again, I'm not being judgmental, but when Elton John and his partner went to have a kid, who do they have to hire? They pretty much have to hire a woman, right? How else can they do it? They can't, they, and they might want to, and I, I don't deny their authentic desire to express their love to each other and be good parents. And, you know, Elton John can certainly afford a kid or two. Uh, but, but having said that, you know, it's like, because men are already less biological or relational than women, individualism is actually harder on them. One more example. I'm using my precious time on this side thing, but what time is it? Just tell me. Quarter after. Quarter after. Um, here, there are two more social trends. This is individualism today. Number one is gray divorce. And I, I'm like a real social scientist. I actually look at this stuff. It's gray divorce. And here's gray divorce. There's this new outbreak of divorce among couples in their 50s and 60s. And this is connected a lot with having fewer kids and living longer. So you have one or two kids. You stay together for the kids. And they're grown up. Uh, they move to Alaska or something. And so the question comes up, why continue to be married? Now, back in the good old days, uh, you pretty much would die not so long after the kids left home and the you know, grandkids were in the neighborhood you had so many ki kids and all that. But today, why stay married? If you're all studying John Locke, John Locke says marriage should last as long as you're raising kids. Uh, then you're free to break the contract. In America, you don't, you know, the contract's looser than that, really. So why stay married? And who, so who thinks why stay married first? Well, men, why? I hope you don't think I'm being sexist, although I'll give you a trigger warning just in case. It's studies show that it's easier for a middle-aged guy to get a younger woman than it is for a middle-aged woman to get a younger man. It's, uh, there's actually probably like a Darwinian uh, reason for that. The middle-aged man can still make his full contribution to reproduction, but a middle-aged woman is typically you know, past her, her time of having kids. So the, the middle-aged, individualistic, emotionally truncated man says, I'll just get me a younger model, and so he does. And then after a few years, uh, the younger model tires of him. And then he ends up lonely, right, by himself, uncivilized by women and children. Um, and meanwhile, his wife, although she may not be able to get another husband, uh, and might, but maybe not, but she has friends. How many of you have noticed this? Women just have more friends than men. You on board with me on that? Especially middle-aged and old women just have more friends. They're more relational. There are exceptions. If there are any feminists here, you can yell at me. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's actually so. So here's another statistic. A very fast-growing category is men over 65 without spouses or close connection to children. And here's the sad thing about those men. They're going to live like that for 20 or 30 years. So that's the downside of individualism. It really devalues uh, the life of old people. So in our high-tech, individualistic country, every preferential option is for the young, right? 
we live in the time of Botox and all that. And where's the, where's the Botox in the plastic surgery injury, uh, industry uh, most advanced in America? They were the most customers. The answer is in Silicon Valley. Because in Silicon Valley, if you look like you're 40, it's like you're over your hill. You're not, you're not a disruptive innovator anymore. It's no 40-year-old guy is going to invent a new app. Or, you know, it's too late. Right? So technology, in every respect, privileges the young. Meanwhile, it's created a society where there are fewer and fewer young people and more and more old people. All right. All right. So quickly, uh, and this is going to be very quick. Uh, what time do we start? 4.30. And what time is it now? Uh, we've, we've gone for a few minutes. Then we're going to stop. Thank you. <laughs> It's actually, it actually was a good ending because it was individualism today. Yeah. I, uh, as, a, as a good friend of Peter's, I take full responsibility for knowing how the reverend Peter was going to lead today and how inflammatory some of his examples or criticisms of contemporary culture would be. I would assume that there's at least one or two of us in this room who would like to ask him if he's really serious about these criticisms of contemporary culture or who would like to either ask him to expand it or to spar with us on this uh, very interesting tape on our current American culture. Please address your questions to it. And really, in all seriousness, the more hostile, the better. I'm all, I'm all uh, you know, you, you can only offend me by agreeing with me in kind of some suck up kind of way. <laughs> so you men here, are, are you guys superfluous? You're on board with that? You okay with that, man? All right, well, that's good. All right, so, uh, so uh, uh, do you agree with me that the era of big government is over because of the demographic crisis? And there's really no obvious way of turning that around because individualism progresses. You're going to live longer, and you're not going to have that many kids. Not you in particular, but in general. Do you see those social trends going on? Yes, sir. Present? Uh, the era of uh, celebrated, okay, I'm going to give you, okay, uh, if you want to read uh, one easy to read book by a brilliant libertarian futurologist or futurist, whatever you want to call these guys, there's this book by Tyler Cowen called Average is Over. And here's what he says, more and more. America is going to be dominated by a cognitive elite, people with big brains. The country is going to be dominated by people who either know how to play with genius machines, who are on very friendly terms with genius machines, because machines are going to be more and more responsible for real productivity. So what's, what's, what's the most efficient thing in America today, really? Because I, I deal with it almost every day. The Amazon warehouse. How many of y'all deal with the Amazon warehouse? You know where these pants came from? I'm not going to show you my underwear, but you know where these pants came from? Uh, the Amazon warehouse. You know where these shoes came from? They're really nice shoes. I got them half price. They're, very, they're not actually nice, but they're very therapeutic. We can, uh, uh, I got them in the Amazon warehouse. And you know what else I've gotten in the Amazon warehouse? Lots of books. Uh, now, how, what's, the, what's the history of the Amazon warehouse? Not so long ago, uh, your typical Amazon warehouse had about 200 employees. Amazon more and more rigorously scripts their work. So all the mental labor is done by the cognitive guys. And these guys become more and more co uh, cogs in the machine. And once they script it, you know who they, they replace them with robots. So the Amazon warehouse is now about 20 people and a bunch of robots. And those 20 people have no freedom of movement. How many, you know, how many of y'all work in a, a chain restaurant? Like uh, in Georgia, we like, we still like Chick-fil-A. But so the ones I know the most about, because Barry College is connected, I know, I know a lot about Chick-fil-A, and I know a lot about Panera. You like Panera? So Panera, Panera, the first thing I said that really resonated, oh yeah, Panera's good. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But, um, that, Everything that the employees at Chick-fil-A and Panera, they work off scripts that have been designed in the home office by experts. 
So well, my favorite example, at Chick-fil-A, you are commanded to say, my pleasure, no matter what the customer says to you. So all the employees in Chick-fil-A are basically masochists. Like, it's all, thank you, sir, may I have another, or more or less. But, uh, all right, so, so ordinary labor is being scripted, which means, Tyler Cowan points out, middle class jobs are simply disappearing. Middle management, how many of y'all plan to go to law school? Don't, <laughs> because the, the, the old career, the old idea of working for a law firm for your whole life, it's not there anymore. Don't do it, it's over. So the era of employer and employee uh, loyalty, the firm and all that stuff, it's gone. All right, don't ask me what you're supposed to do instead. Don't become, you know. Is that a hand back there? We can't hear him back here. Like all right, okay, okay, my fault, my fault, my fault. All right, all right. So the, so the middle class will disappear, mid-management. And then ordinary people uh, will have subsistence jobs. This is what a libertarian futurologist says. And he says, but their lives won't be that bad because they'll have 21st century health care and screens. So here's the great thing about America. Everyone has the same screen. The stuff you see on your screen is what the billionaire sees on his screen. So people will be diverted by the screens and games, or probably legalized marijuana and, and all that. And so the future is not so great, maybe, because the middle class is disappearing. And it's like not much government can do about it. Uh, but my big example here is, is unions. How many already think unions have a future? If you raise your hand, you're a fool. So that disincentivizes raising your hand, probably. Uh, <laughs> but the reasons unions don't have a future is not the Koch brothers and the Amway people. Uh, and a, a, a sudden outburst of a new birth of libertarian consciousness in America is because unions depended upon America dominating the global competitive marketplace. We don't dominate it anymore. And so unions have been taken out with that kind of individualistic economic process. And it's a good unions have been taken out? And the answer is like every social change, yes and no. But here's the part of the no. Uh, in the early 60s, who was the big non-governmental employer in America? Number one. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, good. One point off, but you, know, but you get 19 points. GM, General Motors. So you might want to say, if you said Detroit in general, that would be, that'd be a good enough answer. How much the guys make on the, uh, the assembly line in Detroit? The equivalent of $50 an hour in today's money with perfect health care and unbelievably good pensions. I'm not saying that was just or sustainable, but you know, you could, you could have like a terrible job on the assembly line, and that's the bad news. The good news is you had plenty of money that your wife didn't have to work, you could have you know, a lot of good leisure and all that. Today, who's the main non-governmental employer in America? Walmart. If you, correct, correct, although Walmart. How much do they make at Walmart? They've upped it to about 10 bucks an hour, no benefits, no retirement. So, uh, so Walmart is kind of a, a hothouse for superfluous men because the men aren't making enough money to have families. Understand that? The, uh, I could say a, a billion bad things about working on the assembly line in Detroit or, or a steel mill or whatever, but you did make enough money to have a relational life. Right? And so unions were kind of a barrier to individualism, even as they were corrupt and got, uh, got deals which couldn't be sustained. So it's possible for we conservatives, and even we libertarians, to have a little bit of selective nostalgia for unions. Because the question is, where is the job that pays enough gonna come, uh, gonna come for the average guy now? It's a problem. Is there a government program that can solve this problem? The answer is no. All the Democrats are reactionaries. There's no government solution. The Republicans are the progressives because the Republicans are trying to come up with free market, like, like reform conservatives like Yuval Levin and other reform conservatives. They come up with free market ways of cushioning the changes to come. But can you see all these changes are in an individualistic way, are individually kind of changes, like, so here's some anti-individualism, like, like employer and employee loyalty, toast. Tenure, toast. 
pensions toast. At my college, we have the natural right to save our own money and hope the stock market does not crash. Is that what you have here? <laughs> Peter, let me ask you a question. Now, uh, if uh, individualism is the uh, heart disease that we are suffering from uh, in terms of the pain that you've made of American culture today, what is the antidote? What, 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 is, what is that that will turn this around? What, what will count as success against this, this uh, slide towards the uh, bleakness of individualism? Uh, yeah, that's good. I mean, uh, the number one, let me reinforce a point I must have made, or if I didn't make it, I'm making it right now. There are good things about the progress of individualism. Like, uh, you know, whether or not you're forced same-sex marriage, the acceptance of gays is a good thing. Uh, I'm going to say something very controversial. It actually was a very good thing overall that women entered the work, uh, workplace as free and equal individuals. Uh, and high technology is a good thing. The screen is a good thing used in moderation. And so, I mean, some of this, you know, like all, like all social, pro social change, the progress is ambiguous. It cuts in both directions. So, uh, how, uh, but you know, if you, if you read Tocqueville, you know, that Tocqueville says, what you teach depends upon when you are, when you live. Tocqueville says if he had lived in the time of the end of the Middle Ages, he would have been a materialist. He would have been like Machiavelli or Benjamin Franklin. He would have said, uh, go out, hunt for prosperity, make yourself rich, get your mind off the other world, stop building those ridiculous Gothic cathedrals, and start building stuff that actually can turn people's lives around. Right? But today, we've gone too far in that direction. So today we have to talk up what's neglected, which is spiritual life in, in as many dimensions relational life, pride, families, uh, the idea that what human beings do can endure the test of time, that we're made to know eternal truth, we're made to write books that last for centuries or millennia and, and all that stuff. So uh, the countercultural today is the general relational anti-materialism. And so uh, who should help out here? Well, the church. The church should help out. The church should be better. Uh, people should take their uh, families more seriously. And so here's, a, here's a, some hope. Rich people, sophisticated people, actually their marriages are getting more stable. But not only that, they're becoming in a way more puritanical or judgmental. They may only be having one or two kids, but they disparage romantic love. They disparage free love. Who has time for that? If both uh, spouses have high-powered jobs and you have kids and you're trying very seriously to raise the kids, you don't have time for anyone. Ever. So the family's actually getting better at the top and worse at the bottom because people at the bottom don't have the wherewithal to sustain it. So at the bottom, people have more family values, but actually their families are all messed up. But at the top, people talk like the 60s but act like Puritans. They, they, they don't... They, they're actually, they want divorce laws to be tougher, polls say. Uh, they're kind of against abortion. Not, they don't want abortion completely outlawed, but they're more pro-life than their parents were. So in all times, things cut in both directions. So if I were a hardcore libertarian, I would say the key would be, let everyone get rich and adopt these sensible behaviors of the rich. There's only one problem with that. The contemporary division of labor just won't allow for that. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. Okay, uh, so uh, he, the, uh, the gentleman made a very fine point, and that is you should distinguish between industrial unions and public employee unions. And the public employee unions have gotten ridiculous uh, contracts with, with, with government, as you probably have heard about with Scott Walker in Wisconsin and the city of Chicago basically going broke. 
And uh, so I want, I want, uh, very recently, I had this man pick me up in Boston to take me to Worcester, Massachusetts. He belonged to a public employee union, and he was somehow at work making $45 an hour and driving me in a shovel at the same time. So, so the, the most extreme abuses are all in, in public employee unions. Uh, on the other hand, have you not noticed the Republicans don't seem to be able to distinguish between breaking public employee unions and going after industrial unions? So Scott Walker, who I'm not going to vote for, but nonetheless is a, is a very impressive presidential candidate, he was, he, his, his goal, his brand was breaking the public employee unions, which he did, actually. But then uh, the Republican legislators in Wisconsin made him go after industrial unions too. Uh, and so more and more states are now right to fire, right to work states if you're positive, or right to fire states if you're negative. And so the movement is against unions in general. But it's not, uh, so in other words, what, what the Republicans uh, and, and the big money behind this are doing, uh, they're, they're kicking the life out of something that's already on life support. Public employee unions have no future. Uh, their contracts are unsustainable, they have to be broken in real life. So and they're terrible, I have to admit. So I, I would say it's, it's plain unconstitutional for public employees to unionize. They have too many natural advantages. The contracts aren't going to be fair. I'm more, ambi I'm more ambivalent about steel workers uh, unionizing, actually. But the future will not be with unions. Unions are gone. They're, you, you know, they can't be saved. Peter over here. Yeah. No duties. Um, I'm having trouble seeing how allowing more people to have, like, to be less dignity to their romantic relationships, how that is less loving than people used to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's just a matter of rights, though. I mean, it, it, if you think about it. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be, be, be harsh with you in, in terms of it being factual. If marriage, if we had puritanical marriage, or even the marriage Tocqueville describes in the 19th century, where divorce is very, very hard, where marital fidelity is the norm, and you're stigmatized by the community if you're caught uh, fooling around, and almost every marriage there is is like a lots of kids, uh, how many gay Americans actually would want to get married with all that uh, legal social baggage attached to it? So you have to loosen marriage up. So it's loving in a, in a, in a way, but uh, let me just ask you this, it's a, it's a tough question. Uh, it, it, as a result of allowing uh, same-sex marriage, which I did not come out against because I think it's a logical implication of my understanding of marriage, so someone just sent me something to sign today about uh, it not being a constitutional right. I think it's not a constitutional right, but even it's going to be voted in, so it makes a little difference whether it's a constitutional right. It's more loving in a way, but do you think same-sex marriage will actually add to marital stability? Uh, will there be uh, less frequent divorce as a result of same-sex marriage? So I'm not saying I'm against it, but I'm not saying it's a, it's a new burst of love. And I'm not denying a, a gay guys or, or, or lesbian women love each other, that's not really the point. But isn't it a problem that, uh, you know, Nietzsche says something very controversial, that marital love depends upon basing marriage on something more than love. Because love, uh, love is whimsical, love un untethered for other human relational responsibilities. So how many of y'all are, uh, you, uh, you, you, you loved uh, a man, you loved someone else, and you loved him and you loved him and you loved him, and one morning you wake up and you're not in love, and you look at that guy and you say, what did I ever see in him? You gotta admit this happened to you. What did I ever see in him? And so in the absence of other weighty responsibilities, marriage is just not that stable. If marriage is based on love alone without other relational baggage. I'm not against marriage being based on love because aristocratic marriages had nothing to do with love and so everyone fooled around. And so you had your love partner and your kind of property partner. I'm not for that either, but it has to be love plus. But so why is marital stability the highest value that we have in the problem with modern individualism is the lack of love? 
because uh, I, I didn't get to this part, but, but isn't it true that when you share responsibilities with another human being, love becomes, I was just trying to loot, uh, becomes less romantic but more enduring? In other words, love has to have more weight to it than simply the, the romantic interest. And I'm not denying that you know, some gay couples uh, do have that. I just, uh, I just think it's part of the project to, be, to, uh, to kind of detach the institution of marriage from, uh, from the larger relational network of society. Let me give you an example of this. Um, and again, I didn't come out against same-sex marriage. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court will not stop at same-sex marriage. Because you know, if you, if you read uh, the uh, legal journals uh, written by uh, gay activists, they say something like this. Same-sex marriage isn't actually that good for us because it privileges marital sex over non-marital sex. Where does the law get off privileging marital sex over non-marital sex? Why should my sex life be undignified just because I don't have a piece of paper of marriage? So how do you answer that? It's not, it's not absolutely indispensable, but when you have children, lots and lots and lots and lots of children being raised by a single parent, I'm gonna boldly say there, there are bad things about that. There may even be good things about it, but the bad things about it is, uh, for example, the superfluous men, uh, that on balance it's better for a kid to have both a, a mom and a dad, or at least two parents. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, and there's some correlation between the decline in marital stability and the decline in the sheer number of kids. And it's actually very bad for America to have as many kids, not to have more kids than we have now. We actually don't know how to sustain the future. Like other countries are worse. Uh, one reason the Soviet Union, not Soviet, strike that. One reason Putin's Russia and the Iranians are acting so nutty, aggressive, is they know they have no kids. This is their moment, they have no future. So this is, not, this is not just an American problem, it's a problem in the whole advanced West. And it's, it's, much, wor it's worse, much worse in parts of Europe. It's much, 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 I don't have enough muches to underline the, what I need for, for Japan. I mean, it's, it's it, no one knows how Japan's gonna have a future. And, but what distinguishes the American birth rate from, it makes it a little better, and uh, potentially a lot better than the other countries, is religiously observant Americans. Of course, I didn't get around to talking about religion, uh, but people uh, who believe in a, a relational, personal God actually have more kids. Is it good they have more kids? Sure, we need them. So that would be hope for the future. And I mean, some of there, are, there are some liberals who worry about the birth dearth, and to radically oversimplify their concern, if keeps, things keep going the way they are now, eventually the Mormons will rule us all. How many kids are the Mormons having? Lots. What's the difference between a BYU classroom and this classroom? Baby carriages and pregnant women, lots of them. And half, half or more of the women in the class are married. I'm not endorsing that or not endorsing it, except to say the Mormons are having lots of kids and no one else is. Well, Orthodox Jews are, but aren't that many. Catholics are in pockets, but not overall. And uh, so isn't, isn't, isn't it good? Uh, isn't it a society in which people have you know, hope for the future, they're thinking about the future, they're thinking beyond their own miserable lives when in a society where there's lots of kids? Why is this a bad thing? Why, isn't it better? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we do, and we do, and we don't. Okay. All right, so, uh, I, I compl so a complete account of America would have to include our residual Puritanism, but the main thing we, we keep out, and, and, and because we, if we go by Tocqueville alone, would be the South. The South is, uh, is the inheritors of an aristocracy. So the South is much more honorable 
and much more violent, much more Christian, and in a way much more noble than the rest of the country. And where do our warriors come from? South. And so when we start stupid wars from the Civil War to the Iraq War, who ends up dying? Southerners. So, uh, so where do we have the most draconian death penalties? The South. So the South is, uh, although real life uh, may not uh, live up to the ideals, uh, the South is the most judgmental part of the country, right? and uh, most likely to think the death penalty is just. But how many would, would agree with me that the death penalty is fading? And I don't particularly care if the death penalty has a future, but uh, Texas-style death penalty doesn't have much of a future. Uh, so yeah, the death penalty is an aberration. Uh, if Tocqueville were here today, or had seen 20th, uh, 20th century America, he would have, I think he would have been somewhat surprised to see America remain that Christian. And he would have been very amazed that the South was not as assimilated as he assumed it would be. Because how many, you know, I mean, the South really is different. It's better, everything else is better and worse. You watch American Sniper to see the better side. Uh, but the worst side would be uh, a lot more murders, a lot more death penalty. Uh, and, a lot, lot, you know, and again, uh, a lot more superstition. Like there's very little snake handling in the north. Uh, I don't, you don't have a lot of snake handling around here, do you? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's good. Uh, so so when, we, when you talk about, so when you go to, for example, a, a rural town in Pennsylvania, there are certain characteristics which are very southern, including actually in the rural north, like rural, especially rural Pennsylvania and rural Michigan, country music and NASCAR are loved more than they are in the south, actually. Right, and so isn't it true that your rural guy in Pennsylvania kind of models himself in the southern? That's actually really controversial, but I'm sticking with it, yeah. 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 Uh, you mentioned that, that we need to make more babies, essentially. Um, and people on a whole scale generally are not inclined to smoke, and they're becoming more and more less inclined to smoke. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that was a joke. I'm not, I know, I know. But I'm going to say something very controversial. Smoking is bad for you. Yeah. I, I, I understand that. But, yeah. but people are going to start... People are continuing to live longer and longer and trying, trying consciously to live longer and longer. And so being more intentional about it. That's actually an important point, yeah. So if we, if we start to grow the population further than we already are, are growing the population, which is pretty uh, large, so to speak, we will essentially come to a point where we cannot sustain the population on our planet. We've arguably already overgrown the population for our planet. Um, and, I mean, what would be... What's your address to kind of that situation? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. You know, it's, that's a great question. But it's the general worry about global overpopulation is kind of a 60s thing, right? Uh, so they said we wouldn't be able to feed the population we have. We have more food than, than population now. If people don't eat, it's because you have bad government. I mean, the Green Revolution of the 60s. But what you talk about is a real problem, not so much if people live to 90, but if they live a lot further than that. So the creepy thing about you know, biotechnology, indefinite longevity, the singularity, and, 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 and all these projections, is you just wouldn't have children. So how many all can hardly, uh, how many all long for a world in which it's illegal to have children because no one is leaving, so there's no one to be replaced, and then all sex becomes safe, uh, safe sex by law. So you're right, the trends, if thought through extremely, do, do lead to a world without children. Um, uh, would you be open to the possibility that would be one bleeping screwed up world? Yeah. That same question. Yeah. There's no, this kind of plan doesn't have any catastrophic events at any point. Uh, throughout human history, we've had regular catastrophic events, and I don't mean natural, unnatural wars, Well, that's, that's another, another profound question. So, the general ancient view was 
as civilization uh, was cyclical, and so there were inevitably kind of benign natural catastrophes. And so you'd be, necessity would slap you around for a couple centuries, and you'd have to start over. And this was actually a good thing, because, you know, at times people suffer from an excess of civilization. But the uncanny thing about the modern world is it's been a long time between cycles and you do have a general upward trajectory when it comes to personal liberation and technological progress. And so uh, a lot of people who really think about this hope for the catastrophe. Uh, like Walker Percy, what, what do we do if the bomb doesn't drop? Because if the bomb does drop, the good news is you know exactly what to do. If there's a hurricane or something, then in the other words, you're back to basics. You know what to do. All, all, all individualism disappears when people are in a really screwed up situation. So, um, and you, it goes without saying, in the long term, you are right. And because we've had this long period of time, we forget that you're, you're right. And, and there's kind of this paranoid around, paranoia around the ages about asteroids. Yeah, that we have to get more vigilant when it comes to taking out those asteroids. But it may be bad for us to take out those asteroids that might take us out. So we still are completely subject to natural forces beyond our control, but we're getting more control. But in interstellar, so, oh, well, I got a solution for you. Let's populate a bunch of other planets. So one planet's randomly taken out. We got a bunch of other planets we're living on. And so, but, uh, uh, so right, we, we have forgotten about nature and the fact that we're not going to conquer the whole infinite universe. Our solar system implodes some days. I read something this morning that the whole cosmos is on the downward side of its existence and they only have a couple hundred thousand years left. That's something for you to worry about. We have uh, time for one more question if anyone has one last follow up to uh, Peter. Yes, yes please. Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, so it, it really is true that, the, that uh, I'm going to repeat myself. There is no obvious government solution to any of this. The government we have is the best government we're going to get. I mean, you can tinker with it. Uh, but I, I want to underline that I, I know of no government programs that would cause people to have uh, more babies, right? Uh, Europe, uh, various European countries have tried bribery. Bribery does not work, right? It doesn't, there's no increase. Uh, the one thing the Supreme Court says, which is undeniably true, is we cannot in a free country regard women as baby-making fodder for the state. So we can't send out draft notices. Uh, that, you, know, you go to your mailbox and say you, you have to reproduce within 18 months or something. Uh, we can't do that. So well, what government program is there? So just, just like climate change, is there, is there much we can do to forestall climate? If Al Gore is right, the truth is pretty inconvenient, and what are we going to have to do with the truth? Adjust. And so a lot of uh, futurology is how to adjust, how to, how to live as well as we can with the circumstances we face. So I'm not, uh, and this may have been a disappointing talk, we think I have a revolutionary government solution to this. I actually think uh, it's very misguided to think there's some solution to this. I would even say neither of the two parties is even looking at the right problem, much less coming up with a solution. And that's good enough because there's no solution. The relational institutions that have been, you know, underwritten by government have no future, right? Government's had its partnership with the unions, it's over. Uh, uh, public employees are gonna be like all other employees. Uh, the reason you shouldn't become a professor uh, is tenure is toast. Uh, there won't be tenure in 20 or 30 years. Uh, you're going to work like a contract laborer off someone else's script teaching online courses. Who'd want to do that? Uh, except at Villanova, which will sustain itself miraculously against all the trends. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I want, I want to thank you. Uh, whether or not you agree or disagree with any or all of Peter's individual examples or the overall thrust or the question. Um, one of the things that I love about Peter is willing to ask the question that many people will not ask, willing to put forward an idea that is thought provoking and makes us look beyond the sort of the first easy gloss of, of American culture today. Um, I think that if uh, Stephen Colbert or John Stewart had become a philosopher, they would have become a 
Peter Lawler. Peter Lawler, I think, is the. Uh, the why, 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 why can't I be them, though? <laughs> it's someone who, who makes us think by asking us to think about questions that we normally don't either hear or think about. And I am very happy, Peter, to have had you here at Villanova. And on behalf of Villanova, thank you. All right, Terry, I'll say it's on the camp. Kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sure.